Well, hello, thank you for joining me for another sermon from Town Baptist Church. Uh, we're back in our series Exodus, Stepping Out with a Saving God. We're turning to Exodus chapter 17, uh, starting to read at verse 8. And we're uh, going to read all the way through to the end of chapter 18. So if you want to look that up, uh, find a website, find an app, find a Bible. And uh, we're going to read from Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become an alien in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the desert where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood round him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and laws. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hit dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over hundreds sorry thousands hundreds fifties and tens have them serve as judges for the people at all times but have them bring every difficult case to you the simple cases they can decide themselves that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you if you do this and god so commands you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, 
officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. We finish our reading there, uh, and that's God's word. Uh, we're thinking today about enlisting with God. Enlisting with God. In last week's passage, we thought about trusting God, and that was our title, and that's the format of title that we're going to keep on for a few weeks, God willing. Uh, this week, we're thinking about enlisting with God. Not immediately obvious what I mean by that shorthand, so let me tease it out a little bit. Enlisting means that we submit to a commander, uh, a commander-in-chief, if you are from a certain background. Uh, enlisting means that we sign up to obey his orders, uh, to carry out his plans and achieve his goals. It means that he sets the agenda for us according to his wider purposes. Um, so in human terms, it might look obviously like enlisting in the armed forces to serve in a war effort. It might look like volunteering for a health service during a crisis. It might look like following guidance and keeping your distance from people and practicing good hand washing uh, at the moment. Kind of getting on board with that, enlisting with it. There's a bigger purpose. There's a commander to uh, obey and serve to achieve his goals together. Now, that's not really how um, all of us think about government, is it? But, but come with me on this anyway. It's just a picture. As followers of Jesus, we are a people belonging to God. Uh, he has saved us from his good and right justice that had to be served against us because of our rebellion against him. Uh, he did that by serving sentence not on us, but on his own son in our place. Now, with our sin already judged and our guilt washed clean, uh, we're free to love and worship and serve him. We, uh, we are enlisted. We, we can enlist. Um, we're, we're qualified by his son and we're equipped by his spirit to enlist and to live as his people. Now, what we can sometimes forget, or lose sight of anyway, is that our father in heaven is also our commander in chief. Uh, that he has wider purposes and a greater agenda for this world than, uh, than simply us and what's going on with us right now. Now, because he's our father, he is uniquely loving and he cares intimately about what is going on with us right now. And because he's God, he is able to manage and direct all things from global affairs to your daily uh, trials and triumphs um, and achieve exactly his purposes at every level, working for the good of those who love him and working for all that he's promised on the grandest of scales. Uh, <clears throat> but as we sometimes forget, he does have a grand scale and a great agenda ongoing. God is at work in this world uh, and, and in history and in eternity and things will not always be as they are now. This world is shaken up at the moment, isn't it? By the departure from normal life as a result of this COVID-19 virus. We had a way of life, we assumed it was stable and it would just kind of go on indefinitely, but everything's been completely disrupted by this virus and our need to isolate ourselves. Um, effects on health, on jobs, on businesses, on emotional and mental health and, and much more besides, you know what's going on. Uh, and everything has changed to an extent that we didn't think was possible. Um, in the last few years, we thought the biggest global shift that could ever happen was something like a country exiting from a union of countries. <laughs> um, you know, the Brexit referendum has been described as a political earthquake. Little did we know uh, how much more things could be shaken up. But when we open the Bible, uh, we find a God, our commander in chief, who is intent on shaking things up uh, to an extent that we can still hardly imagine, even at a shaky time like this. Uh, we find a God who is going to change the global status quo completely and forever. Uh, new life, new health, new government. Uh, sin quarantined forever, uh, sickness, sadness, death, mourning, all eradicated like old diseases that have no power over our new eternal immunity. Uh, and as God's church, as God's church, we of all people should be those who know that the earthly status quo is never permanent uh, and whatever way things are right now is never going to last. 
uh, whatever new normal we come to as we adjust to this coronavirus, that new normal won't be forever either. Uh, God has bigger plans to shake things up in ways that will amaze even people like us who live through such a shaky time as this. And we get a sense of this and just a hint of it in today's passage in Exodus. It's a strange episode. Bits of it don't really seem to fit where we find them. Uh, in fact, the events of chapter 18 uh, at least might have happened a little bit later. Uh, it might have been reported here as a kind of bridge between two great sections of, of the story. Um, so now that the Exodus escape is complete and before we come to the huge sections of, of the Bible, several books, where God teaches his people how to obey and worship and live with him and live for him, we have this little gap, this little window onto all that he's achieving in all of this. We have a window into the ways that our uh, commander in chief is shaking up the whole world according to his plans and purposes. And so in, as we enlist with God, we are enlisting to serve his purposes to all that he's doing uh, as he shakes things up forever. Uh, so what is he doing? Uh, what are his grand plans? Um, how do we see them here in this little gap, this little window? How are they played out in miniature here in the history of Israel? Let's see, three plans uh, God has for Israel and in time for the whole world uh, through Jesus. And the first of them is this. God will judge the nations in rebellion. God will judge the nations in rebellion. We're always lulled into thinking that yeah, nothing ever changes. But, uh, but here's a major change coming to this world. God will judge the nations in rebellion. And that's played out in chapter 17, verses 8 to 16. In verse 8, the Amalekites come and attack the Israelites and provoke a battle. Moses puts his assistant, Joshua, more about him uh, later in the Bible, uh, in charge of the armed response. And Moses takes his staff, uh, this staff of God, up onto a nearby hill. I'm reading... Uh, I'm reading Lord of the Rings at the moment with one of uh, one of the kids, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, just the first the first book. I can't help just because of the way I am in my head at the moment. I can't help seeing Moses as a kind of Gandalf figure, uh, holding his staff on the bridge in Moria. You know, it's not all that helpful an image. I'm not entirely sure why I'm sharing it. Let's move on. Verse eleven. Verse eleven. Where is it? Quickly. Uh, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites uh, were winning. And usually this episode is used to say something about uh, the need to raise our hands in prayer when we're in the battles of life. Uh, but Moses, well, that's right, obviously, we should. Uh, but Moses doesn't actually say he's going to pray. Uh, and prayer is not mentioned here at all. Uh, this is about holding up his staff. This is the staff that was used to strike God's judgment onto Egypt in verse uh, in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 14. It's the staff used to strike judgment on God himself uh, earlier in chapter 17, uh, as God took the judgment that his people deserved and poured out a blessing on them instead. We saw that last week. Uh, and now the staff of God's judgment is raised against the Amalekites until verse 13, where they are overcome. This is about God's judgment on this nation, the Amalekites, for, uh, for attacking Israel and for what that actually means behind the scenes. Uh, and this is how God explains it as well. Verse 14, uh, do, 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 do. the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So God is judging and God will judge the Amalekites. And Joshua needs to hear it not only to understand just uh, what's happened on the battle he was just fighting, or, uh, but, but also so that he understands what he needs to do in the future when he leads the Israelites against them again. And then verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of God. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. The Lord is my banner. Um, in a battle, you rally to your banner. You follow your banner. Um, for Israel, the banner is not held by Joshua on the battlefield, but by Moses on the hill. The banner is God himself. His people rally to him. His people follow him. Verse 16 probably means 
and that the hands of the Amalekites were raised against God. Um, his hands lifted up to the throne of God. Um, probably, I think, means the Amalekites. So if someone lifts their hand to you, they're probably going to hit you. Um, or think of fists being shaken in defiance. Verse 16, the Amalekites were shaking their fists at God. Um, and God will lift his hand in judgment. Uh, just like Moses is doing here, until that judgment is complete, as rebels and rebellion itself are wiped out. And as verse 16 predicts, that rebellion will be persistent. The Amalekites will keep coming back against God and his people. They actually return a year after this incident. Uh, the fear of them is part of the reason the Israelites are too afraid to enter the promised land when they get there the first time. When they do enter it, the Amalekites oppose them through the book of Judges, uh, 1 Samuel uh, and a little beyond. But the enmity goes backwards as well. Amalek himself, the figure, because these names come from um, fat, uh, ancestors. Amalek himself was a grandson of Esau. So this fight goes back to Esau and Jacob, who butted heads, didn't they? Jacob, who is renamed Israel, father of the Israelites. Uh, it reflects back to, to the brothers Cain and Abel. Uh, and their, their, their disagreement, their fight, uh, and rebellion against God goes all the way back to Satan, uh, all the way back, all the way back to him, uh, to his rebellion against God, all the way forward as well to to Babylon and Israel, all the way forward to the world and the church. Um, all of these are pictures of rebellion ultimately against God, and God will judge the nations in rebellion. He will quash all rebellion. Uh, and since he is perfectly good and right and just, then it is perfectly good and right and just that he should do that. Uh, this, this rebellion, this age-old shaking of fists against God is totally wrong. You know, we don't much like to think about judgment uh, and the justice of God. But when we get a proper view of him, of his perfect goodness, his, his rich generosity, his abundant patience and his loving kindness, then we get a whiff of how offensive it is to rebel against him. You know, I've been walking along um, a country road some of these afternoons, just along from our house, well within the two kilometer limit. Um, imagine listening to this sermon like a year down the line, it'd be what? Two kilometer what? Anyway, but there's a huge stone wall along the footpath, about half a kilometer from the house, I think. Um, but well, about half a kilometer from the house, I, I think it is that there's a there's something on the other side of the wall that has died. You know, the wall's too high to see what it is, and it's not the sort of place you want to linger because I don't know if it's a sheep or a deer or some badger or I don't know what, but it reeks. Oh, it is an affront to the nose. It's an offence to the country air of, of Brannockstown. Um, it's just foul. You know, growing up, uh, we had a dog that would, uh, would find that sort of thing on walks and roll in it, just get it all smeared. And she had long hair as well, so she really could pick it up. And despite all commands to the contrary, she would she would rebel until she herself was an offensive stench and subject to the chilly judgment of the garden hose. Um, rebellion against a God like our God, a God like Jesus, Jesus who is the image of God and the exact representation of his being, says, uh, in the New Testament, that, that rebellion stinks and it won't be allowed into God's house. He will judge the nations in rebellion and it'll be deserved, it'll be necessary, it'll be right and it'll be good. Um, and the amazing thing about God though is not just his perfect justice but his loving mercy uh, because we've all shaken our fists at God, haven't we? We've all raised our hands and our hearts against him uh, but while Moses raises his hands to dispense God's judgment, Jesus spreads his hands to receive it in our place. And that's why uh, our second point is kind of paradoxical to the first. So God will judge the nations in rebellion. But the second grand plan is God will welcome the nations in worship. God will welcome the nations in uh, to worship, that's our second heading. It's the second of our, our commander's grand plans for the world uh, and our second little window into what he's doing on this global scale. God will welcome the nations to worship. We're going to see this played out in chapter 18, first half thereof. Now, the chapter ends with Moses applying God's law to the people. Now, that hasn't been given yet, 
Um, so Jethro's arrival might have come a little bit later uh, and just be kind of moved up the, the order here, um, included so that it doesn't interrupt the flow of the rest of the book later on. It doesn't really matter if that's the case or not. Moses' father-in-law arrives with his wife and two sons. Moses met and married Zipporah during his, his own personal mini exodus. Do you remember when he, he killed the Egyptian and had, and had to flee Egypt and he went off into the wilderness in the same direction as these people are going now for 40 years, same uh, sort of length of time, uh, met God in the fire of the burning bush on the mountain, the same place where he's going to meet God at Sinai in fire on the mountain uh, with all of the people. So he went on this mini exodus. That's when he met um, Zipporah and married her. He brought her back to Egypt, it seems, when he went uh, to lead the Israelites out. But it also seems like he sent her back to her father before things with Pharaoh got too intense. Uh, now there's a family reunion and there's this strange emphasis, isn't there? Not on Moses being reunited with his wife and sons, but uh, with his father-in-law, Jethro. Uh, so verse 7, he bows down and kisses him. Uh, you know, two things I've never done for my father-in-law, but um, hey, when lockdown ends, who knows? Um, <clears throat> Jethro is the priest of Midian. Midian uh, was another one of these sort of family nations, the Midianites descended back from, from Midian, uh, like Israel. Uh, Jethro seems to have been a priest of God, not of, of different gods, but of, of the actual real God, Elohim. Uh, but he doesn't seem to know that God is the true Lord of all. So verse 11, he seems to learn that, doesn't he? Uh, he's a foreigner to Israel, but he's not like the Amalekites. God's judgment on the nations is not the whole story, Remember, God promised Abraham that all nations would be blessed through his family. So what actually happens uh, with Jethro is that a non-Israelite, basically a Gentile, is told of all that God has done to save his people. And he comes to a, a greater knowledge of that God and faith in that God uh, until he worships him alongside Israel. Um, let, let, let's see it happen. So uh, chapter 18 uh, verse 8, first Moses tells Jethro about God. Verse 8, uh, where is it? Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Uh, so Moses tells Jethro, that's step one. Then we hear Jethro's response in verses 9 to 11. Jethro uh, was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians he said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. So Jethro responds and he's delighted and, um, to come to this new knowledge. And then we see him worship God and enjoy fellowship with God's people. Verse 12. Uh, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. Uh, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. So Moses' witness to Jethro leads to faith in Jethro and then uh, to worship and fellowship with Jethro. Uh, witness leads to faith leads to worship and fellowship. Um, and this is no accident, is it? God explained that his rescue of Israel would mean that his name would be proclaimed among the nations. And that's happening uh, in this episode. It happened in one way for the soldiers of Amalek. It's happened another way uh, for the priest of Midian. Some will tremble at the mention of God, but others like Jethro, verse 9, will be delighted and be drawn in. And so we have a dramatic rescue a chosen people proclaiming their God to the nations, resulting in united worship and a meal in the presence of God. And really, that ought to remind us of something, shouldn't it? <laughs> um, a dramatic rescue, a chosen people proclaiming their God to the nations, resulting in, in united worship and a fellowship meal in the presence of God. Sounds a lot like Easter, doesn't it? And the witness of the church through the ages and the fellowship of the Lord's table as we break bread together, verse 12, um, in anticipation of the great banquet of heaven, the ultimate meal of worship and fellowship for all tribes and nations and tongues 
there in the presence of God. God will welcome the nations uh, to worship. And surely that can encourage us to share what the Lord has done. Moses shared the Exodus, but we get to share about Easter. We get to share a rescue that's not just for uh, a nation, but for the whole world. Um, some people, of course, will react very badly to that message, like the Amalekites. Uh, we, we should expect that. Some people will hate us. They'll gossip about us. They'll nitter and undermine us, however, however they can. We should expect that, and we should not be put off. Because some people will be delighted uh, to hear such great news. Some will be drawn in by this new knowledge and drawn in faith and hope and love and drawn in to share the fellowship meal of the Lord's table, uh, their Lord, until we feast with them in heaven itself. Um, so as we enlist with God, as we conform to his will, to his commands, to his agenda in the world, we see uh, first from this passage that God will judge the nations in rebellion. And then we see that God will welcome the nations to worship. Last we see that God will govern the nations with justice. God will govern the nations with justice. The story seems to go off on a, an unexpected detour uh, in chapter um, 18, verses 13 to 27. Jethro sees Moses hearing all the disputes and cases brought to him by the people. Remember, there are 600,000 men plus women and children, so it's obviously a huge workload. And twice we're told that the people stood around Moses from morning till evening, verse 13 and 14. Uh, and, and verse 17, Jethro, with his fresh eyes and insight that you need sometimes from the outside, he says, look, this is not a good idea. You cannot handle this, uh, this work alone. Uh, it's not good for you. It's not good for these people either queuing all day to see you. You need to get help. Uh, and they all need you to get help too. And so Jethro has a three-step plan smart guy. Uh, three steps to a more efficient work life. Step one, equip the people. Verse 20, teach them the decrees and laws and show them the way to live and the duties they are to perform. Step two, delegate. Verses 21 and 22, <clears throat> select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, uh, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Uh, have them serve as judges for the people at all times. Uh, and then step three, verse 22, uh, share the responsibility. Have them bring every difficult case to you at uh, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they'll share it with you. Uh, that's, that's Jethro's three-step plan. Uh, and so the easy stuff gets dealt with at ground level and the trickier it gets, the higher up it goes. And the result you can expect uh, is verse 23. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. So here's the management technique that we need to follow. Uh, train up a godly leadership team, delegate responsibility uh, and save yourself for the hardest parts of the work. And everybody's happy and nobody burns out. Of course, Exodus is not a book about good management techniques. It's about God rescuing his people and forming them into a nation uh, so that he can dwell with them. So he can dwell with human beings for the first time since Genesis chapter 3. Um, and one major feature of, of dwelling with God, and something that we take for granted, but is not at all a given at this time in history, is that God's people will be governed justly by the rule of law. God's law is about to be given in the coming chapters, and in fact books, because as they arrive at Sinai, they'll be there for, I forget, several books of the Bible anyway. Um, God's people will be governed by the rule of law. Um, not a given. We are so used to it in countries like Ireland and the UK. We live according to laws. No one is above the law, um, in theory at least. Um, it's not perfect, of course, but generally speaking, we can have pretty good confidence that uh, our national laws are implemented by the police and by the courts fairly and without bribery or corruption. Um, God's people will not exist in chaos. God's nation will not be a society in which the strong or the rich or the powerful can uh, do whatever they want and get away with it. God's nation will not be a society where the weak and the marginalized and the poor are stripped of rights and left with no voice. And God's nation will be a society where they are taught how to live to please God himself. Um, love for the Lord and love for one another. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength 
and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how God's law in total will be summarized and condensed because that's the purpose of God's law. That's what God's law is designed to do and to create love for God and love for each other. That is the kind of society that God will build. Uh, and look what it means. Verse 20, uh, the people can live rightly. And verse 23, the people can be satisfied. In our culture, we tend to think of freedom as the absence of law. So I can be free only when no one can tell me what to do. You know, so my body, my choice, say those on the far left who want abortion on demand. Um, <laughs> And bizarrely at the moment, my body, my choice, say protesters on the far right who want to open up businesses in the middle of a pandemic. You can't tell me what to do, screams the, the stereotypical teenager. Uh, freedom is about the absence of law, or, or so we think. But freedom, of course, is not in the absence of all constraint, but in the presence of, of the right constraint, isn't it? You might look at a poor goldfish. Um, poor Goldie Goldfish, uh, stuck in her bowl, swimming round and round all day, uh, very, very boring. But lift her out and set her free on the kitchen floor, and, and you'll find that that freedom doesn't suit her, doesn't help her. Uh, we might ditch all laws related to traffic. Let's just get rid of it all. Traffic signals, uh, lights, um, parking restrictions double parking, giving way to the right, driving on the left, let's just get rid of it all. We'd have a lot more freedom on the roads, uh, but it wouldn't be good for us, would it? It wouldn't really help us. God's law is the right constraint. It's the right environment in which we live and thrive. Left under the rule of self, we raise our fists to God like the Amalekites, but brought under the rule of God, we live in peace with him and with one another and everyone goes home satisfied. It's a hint of heaven on earth. Um, and just as Israel was governed by God's law and the church is now governed by God's word, so in the new creation, God's people will live in peace according to his rule. He will govern the nations with justice. That is the the final, in this passage at least, the final element of his, his grand plan. So let's bring them together, the, th the three of them. God will judge the nations in rebellion. God will welcome the nations to worship. And God will govern the nations with justice. These are the grand plans of the God of Exodus. These are the grand plans of the God of Easter. They're the grand plans of our commander-in-chief. Rebellion will be put down once and for all as it, as it should be and, and must be. But in his mercy, countless multitudes will be welcomed to worship. And finally, we will live in perfect obedience to his perfect rule. That's what God is working on. Um, that's what he's doing in the world. That's what he's doing as he shakes things up. That's what he will fully and finally achieve when he shakes things up in the end. So how do we enlist? How do we, uh, how do we get on board with uh, with those plans, this this agenda. Well, a few things, a few thoughts coming from from this passage. Uh, one thing is not by trying to make these things happen by ourselves. Um, can't really miss it. But twice Moses is exhausted in these chapters, exhausted, um, signalling God's judgment, and exhausted governing with God's justice. He is not God. Is the message, <laughs> Moses leading the people uh, and all of that and he's a vital character but he's not God we can't force heaven on earth uh, we're not capable of it we don't have it in us instead we look to the true and better Moses uh, we look to Jesus to the one who will see these aims and plans ultimately achieved in full uh, he is going to judge all the nations he will welcome the worshippers and he will rule God's kingdom. He's the one who will really shake up this world in ways that we can't imagine. He's the one who will establish the most unbelievably brilliant new normal, the eternal new normal. And so if we're going to enlist in, in our hearts and our minds and get on board with God's agenda, uh, in our hearts and our minds. We need to look to Jesus and to all of God's plans and purposes 
in and through him. And then I think we can also do the one thing in this passage that doesn't exhaust Moses. So chapter 18, verse 7, uh, we can go out and invite people in. So that verse 8, we can tell them of everything the Lord has done uh, for our sake and how he has saved us and can save them too. Let's pray. We're going to need his help. Father, we are feeling shaken by all that's happening in the world at the moment. We are, we are scared of it. We're tired of it. We're frustrated by it. And we wish things would get back to the way that they always were. Uh, but help us in this time to realize and remember that things were never going to stay one way and that you have a great overarching agenda for this world that you've made, that you will shake it once and for all as you establish the new creation. Help us to uh, enlist with that in our hearts and our minds to get on board with it, to want it, to hope in it, because only then will everything be truly right and only then will we find true safety and true perfect best. As we hope more and more in you and in your purposes in and through our Lord Jesus, would you stir us to want to share him more and more with the people we know so that they, like us, might know his goodness his forgiveness, his welcome, and his love. And we ask all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me from, for this, uh, this sermon from Exodus. Next week, God willing, we'll take a look at chapter 19. So you might want to read that ahead of time. And until then, God bless.